so good evening everyone uh, for joining us today for the session on uh, modern trends and management of uh, breast cancer in uh, today's scenario uh, where we can see n number of uh, uh, cancer cases rising up in uh, women's uh, side today uh, we met piper technologies and jona med is having a privilege uh, to wel uh, to welcome our beloved speaker and also dr jairaman sir Mr. Moti sir from IMA Chennai will welcome and Aina Varam for uh, uh, giving us an opportunity for collaborate in association with MGM Healthcare and uh, Varam. Uh, over to you, Dr. S. Jairam. Uh, thank you, uh, Swamiya ma'am. So thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity. So uh, very good evening, everyone. Um, this special webinar mainly to commemorate the World Cancer Day. You all know very well, every year, in the month of February 4th, it's a World Cancer Day. So cancer, if you take the one of the top 10, top five causes of death in the world, so among the cancer, the breast cancer is the number one in the global scenario and in Indian scenario, is the number one cancer, morbidity and mortality. Despite the lack of a screening, diagnostic and treatment modality, this is the number one cancer. So if you take the world scenario, lung cancer in men and women is the number one cancer in the global scenario. So in female populations, uh, next to lung cancer in the Western world, the second is uh, breast cancer. But in the Indian scenario, the uh, breast cancer, cervical cancer are the predominant uh, female cancers, a lot of morbidity. Despite the best screening modalities, a lot of uh, sufferings because of the lack of awareness in the you know, screening, uh, the and the diagnostic and treatment aspects. So to commemorate this uh, World Cancer Day, today we have chosen the topic of uh, breast cancer screening diagnosis and the treatment modalities. So we, today we have a very you know, well-renowned uh, you know, oncologist in Chennai and in Tamil Nadu and in India. So uh, uh, Dr. Alex A. Prasad. Uh, Dr. Alex, uh, he finished all the oncology special institutions from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And he's uh, currently is a senior consultant, radiation oncology in, uh, and uh, he's a chairman of uh, Chennai Cancer Care Hospital and founder of uh, uh, Cancer Care Foundation, and the president of uh, Radiation Oncologist Tamil Nadu and Puducherry Chapter. So Alex is going to give a you know, talk on modern trends in the management of breast cancer. So with this few introduction, I um, hand over the mic to Dr. Alex A. Prasad. Alex, over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jairaman. Thank you, Dr. Moti Narayanan. Are you audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Audible. Thanks. Uh, at the outset, I would uh, wish to thank the IMA Chennai William and Lionel branch, NGM Healthcare, Varam, uh, my friend uh, Dr. Jairaman, Dr. Moti Narayanan, and all the office bearers of this particular Chennai Vilivaka Mayanavaram branch. Thank you very much for this opportunity because uh, this is a big platform to uh, discuss uh, and debate on uh, uh, issues related to modern trends in breast cancer management. And that's what we are going to talk about. Thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, can we jump jump into the presentation? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. So before uh, before entering into the presentation, I just thought we will uh, uh, look into the incidence of breast cancer in India, in different parts of India, and also different parts of the world. So if you if you see here uh, the pie chart which explains uh, breast is uh, one of the big chunk, followed by uh, uterine cervix, followed by ovarian malignancy. Uh, all the other cancers uh, make a big chunk, but look at the big share which breast has. The incidence is about 27.9% for breast cancer in India, in the female age group of 50 to 69 years age group. Uterine cervix is 16.5%. The ovarian malignancy is 5.6%. So the incidence of breast cancer is very high, in Indian females. A decade back, the incidence of uterine cervix was high, but now the uterine uh, cervix has come down and the cancer of the breast has really gone up. The breast cancer statistics in the United States. Uh, uh, most common cancer in women in 2021, look at breast in the United States, is 30%, followed by lung and bronchus. As Dr. Jairaman uh, mentioned, lung and bronchus is the second, 13% uh, in the United States, followed by colon, rectum, it's about 8%. The uh, uterine corpus is 7%. So breast, again here, worldwide, if you see, it's, it's, a, it's a big number and it's a big percentage of the 
worldwide uh, incidence of uh, women cancers. The breast cancer of incidence in Tamil Nadu. One point what, uh, when I made the slide, uh, which was uh, I found alarming a trend was the Tamil Nadu Cancer Registry Project. Findings showed that the incidence of breast cancer in women and cervical cancer in Chennai and Perambalur was the highest in India. Uh, this was uh, pretty alarming because uh, I didn't know that. Uh, and I had really uh, looked into the information to find out that this right was right. The incidence uh, in women, especially the breast cancer and cervix cancer in Chennai and Perambalu is the highest in India. So this is a point to be noted down here, which I really did not know till now. Uh, if you look at the number of uh, new cases of cancer in general, not just breast alone, in new cases alone, the female cancers are very high, about 36,319. And male... It's about 28,971. So the women cancer surpassed the male cancers uh, of the new cases in 2016 and beyond. If you look at the common cancers among the women in Tamil Nadu, breast is the highest, followed by uterine cervix, followed by ovary, the large bowel, and the mouth. And the risk factors, as we all know, some of the commonest factors, tobacco, lifestyle, and unhealthy eating habits. Lifestyle, lifestyle, as you see, like a, a decade back, as I already mentioned, Uterine cervix is the commonest in women here, followed by uh, uterine, uh, followed by the breast cancer. But in, in, in Mumbai, always women cancer, breast was the first one, followed by uterine cervix. But they, they were trying to find out what could be the cause. It was lifestyle modification. Women there were much more educated, much more career oriented. They were not getting married at the uh, uh, younger age group. They got married uh, later part, elderly, primary, all, all the uh, lifestyle and uh, lifestyle modifications uh, made a big uh, uh, reason why uh, women uh, cancer there was breast cancer was very common there. In Chennai, uterine cervix was very common, followed by trend, uh, followed by the breast cancer. But now even here, the trend has completely changed. Uh, the most important risk factor what we see in uh, breast cancer is birth of first child after the age of 30 years of age group, environmental exposure, and genetics less than 10 percent of the cases. The most uh, commonest cancer killer in women in 2021 was, was carcinoma breast. Looking at the risk factors, increased almost twofold if a woman had one affected first degree relative in the family. If the risk increases threefold if she had two affected first degree relatives. Early menarche, late menopause, excess body weight. Excess body weight, obese ladies are very prone to get. Uh, uh, uterine malignancy and uh, breast cancer. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a well-known cause. High estrogen and testosterone levels, elderly primary. When I say elderly primary, it's about uh, the first uh, childbirth at the age of 30 and above. Never ever breastfed for a child. That also is a risk factor for breast cancer, hyperplasia, fibroadenoma, and hormonal contraceptives. These are all the commonest risk factors uh, which could be the uh, reason for cancer breast uh, incidence being really going high. The breast cancer statistics in Indian women, if you look into, the breast cancer mortality rates in India was 1.7 times higher than the maternal mortality rate. This is a point to note here. It's higher than the maternal mortality rate. And about one in 28 Indian women are expected to develop breast cancer during their lifetime. One out of every 28 women, the risk, expo the chance of getting uh, the breast cancer is uh, high. Collectively, if you see, the US, India, and China account for almost one third of the global breast cancer cases. This is the breast cancer stats on Indian women. Now, uh, entering into the initial parts of uh, how to uh, work up on a breast cancer, first thing what we usually do is we try to do a metastatic workup or a stage, staging workup on a breast cancer. But a decade back, there was a multiple uh, or battery of tests which we were doing like a chest x-ray, a CD scan of the thorax, an abdomen ultrasound, a bone scan, and so many scans and so many tests were being done. And ultimately we land up in a stage as well as a metastatic workup. But right now what we do is the, the biggest boon for oncologists now is whole body PET CD scan. Whole body PET CD scan is really a big boon for oncologists because this is one one scan, which is a fusion of uh, a PET and CD, throws light on everything from top to bottom. It gives information about the osseous metastasis, the pulmonary metastasis, the hepatic metastasis, the lymph nodes, the brain. 
everything from top to bottom everything is screened so this whole body pet scan is is the biggest boon for radiation oncologists and uh, medical oncologists and surgical oncologists for staging as well as for a metastatic workup to find out if there is any lesion elsewhere for example if you see here one you could see some lesions in the lytic lesions especially in the in the, the vertebrae in the the dorsal and the lumbar vertebrae you can see some lesions here similarly there are lesions seen in the liver here there's one lesion seen here so so this is this is one scan which throws light on everything so it's a wonderful investigation to work it out on this is a bone scan this is very common about a decade back even now if we if if at all the oncologist suspects in in terms of lytic lesion or any uh, lesion in the scan we go for a bone scan and this scan throws light on anything on the osseous metastasis anywhere in the skeletal system you could see this is actually a uh, bone scan which is uh, done uh, prior to the treatment this is after the treatment you can see the difference between the uh, previous and the post treatment bone scans screening uh, whenever in in uh, in breast cancer when we talk in terms of screening the most important tool is mammogram mammogram is a is is, is still the best screening tool for uh, breast cancer and uh, any annual mammogram if someone wants to start it they should start at 40 years of age group or 44 years if there is a family in the in the, in the in the family the recommended age for a baseline to start a mammogram is 36 years and anyone who is 55 plus should do for a bone scan every 2 years and this is a uh, this is a standard which you should follow for screening uh, mammogram zero mammography is one slight modified uh, mammography it's much more sensitive the only thing is uh, it, the exposure of radiation to the breast is slightly high but otherwise zero mammography is much more clear and sensitive than the normal mammogram uh, management strategies for breast cancer you classify as early stage you classify as late stage and local regional advanced and distal metastatic uh, uh, disease this is how uh, easy to uh, strategize the management uh, protocols to follow and I, I, I always used to follow this system because there are multiple staging systems where I tried to follow this Manchester staging system. Where most of my, uh, my uh, training was in Manchester Christie's. So this is one system which they used to follow that and I used to follow this. It's simple, it is easy. In, in simple words, stage one is growth is confined to the breast. Stage two is growth confined to the breast, but palpable and mobile lymph nodes in the axilla. Stage three is the growth extends beyond the mammary parenchyma. That could be skin invasion or fixation. That could be ulceration of the skin. That could be tumor fixation to the underlying muscle or fascia. That could be axillary nodes, but it should be present. Uh, if it's present, it should be mobile. Stage four is anything which beyond the breast area as shown by fixation or mating of the axillary nodes, complete fixation of the tumor to the chest wall, deposits to supraclavicular nodes, uh, straight to the opposite breast and distant metastasis. Uh, the point to note here is supraclavicular node uh, spread to the opposite breast, distant metastasis, and mating of uh, the mating of axillary lymph nodes. They all take it to stage four. So this is this is one easy system to comprehend uh, whenever we plan uh, a, a treatment strategy for stage one, two, three, and four. The other strategies apart from that is uh, based on the uh, ERPR. ERP is estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor status. Her to use human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. When all these receptors are negative, we call them triple negative. When all these three receptors are positive, we call them as triple positive. This also could be an important prognosticative indicator whenever we uh, term in terms of, when we think in terms of a, a plan to strategize uh, the next uh, therapy for uh, that particular stage in breast cancer. Hormone therapy, before, before going into the main details like, uh, like uh, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, triple negative, I thought hormone therapy is one important therapy uh, which is very important and very useful and uh, the, the yield out of this hormone therapy is very high. Uh, the, the results are very good and it's very simple and it's economical, not that expensive too. So I thought we will have a few words about the hormone therapy, anti-estrogen uh, the, the, in the, the anti-estrogen category, you have tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a very common uh, uh, drug which uh, uh, oncologists, left and right, uh, write about it. Whenever they see that is the ERPR positive status, 
in the uh, tumor, uh, in the tumor. And similarly, uh, the off late after tamoxifen, the most commonest, which we write is aromatous inhibitors like litrazole, anestrozole, eximestin. And beyond this, anti estrogen therapy, when there is progression of disease, you think in terms of fulvestrant. Androgens like flu oxy, mestiron, mTOR inhibitor, PARP inhibitor, BRCA mutation. These are all the recent advances in the uh, management of breast cancer. mTOR inhibitor is uh, uh, Everlimus, PARP inhibitors, Iniparib, BRCA mutation is Olaparib and Veloparib. These are all the uh, latest drugs which are added to this armamentarium in the treatment of uh, breast cancer. Uh, this gentleman, uh, I am always very, very fond of this gentleman's facial expression. So I thought I'll post a few pictures like this so that people, if they are very lethargic, can have a look at this. And this is just a brain teaser to alert you people, everyone. Because these days, uh, a presentation at home is like work from home. And whoever is watching this also like working from home, watching from home. So it's, it's very easy to uh, become lethargic and uh, uh, sedating. So I thought I'll put a few brain teasers so that uh, you get alerted. Hormone therapy in the adjuvant setup. Tamoxifen has been an uh, agent of choice for all the postmenopausal patients, especially when there is estrogen receptor positivity. And fulvestrant is one where there is estrogen receptor positivity metastatic lesion in postmenopausal women when there is disease progression following the anti estrogen therapy. Fulvestrant is one which is used as the next line whenever there is progression of therapy, if the ER positivity is there and there are disease progression is there. Anti estrogens, why? why? Well, what, what do anti estrogens do? It is a steroidal anti estrogen, it promotes accelerated ER. ER is estrogen receptor turnover estrogen receptor protein levels, ER dimerization. It reduces shutting of the ER from the cytoplasm. It was actually started with one intramuscular monthly injections, but the results were found to be very good. And now it's given as a monthly, three times it's given as injections, and the results are very, very good. Fulvestrin, anti steroidal anti-estrogen in breast cancers when there is progression of disease, when estrogen receptors pass due. Hormone therapy, uh, though the, uh, the results are very good, there is uh, certainly some amount of toxicity also, and the toxicity management is very important. Most common is what you see is heart flushes, vaginal bleeding. When you see this, you should do a routine workup and watch out for endometrial malignancy in postmenopausal females. That's why whenever we write these patients on hormone therapy, we try to find out and do an ultrasound to find out if there is any endometrial hyperplasia, any problem in the endometrial uh, layers. And if we, if we find there is a problem, we skip tamoxifen, and we go to the next one, which is litrozole. Otherwise, tamoxifen is more than enough. And all these hormone therapy uh, uh, tablets and injections are known to give osteoporosis. The treatment for osteoporosis is calcium supplements, vitamin D, and bisphosphonates, biphosphonates. And the other important factor, apart from ER, PR, epidermal receptor, progesterone receptor, the human epidermal growth factor receptor that's hurt to new is very important because uh, whenever the HER2 new receptors are positive, you try to negate that by using, by giving some monoclonal antibodies like uh, uh, trastuzumab, as receptin, pertuzumab, or lapatinib. Trastuzumab is an adjuvant, new adjuvant, and metastatic setting it can be given, whereas lapatinib is not an adjuvant, it's given as new adjuvant and metastatic setting. Breast is always considered as a systemic disease and all the patients needed chemotherapy at any point of time. And chemotherapy has to be given to all the patients, even if it's stage one, stage two, stage three. It's a systemic disease which always needs chemotherapy. And the multimodal approach plays a very important role in breast cancer management. New adjuvant chemotherapy, we call it as the NACT. Uh, uh, the goal of new adjuvant chemotherapy is to optimize surgical outcome. Most of the time, after one or two cycles of new adjuvant chemotherapy, the, patient, uh, the patient's tumor becomes easily operable and the margins becomes very clear. So to, to, to optimize the surgical outcome, standard for larger and stage three tumors. Big tumors, stage three tumors, new adjuvant chemotherapy is always a must. Marginally resectable tumor to make it more resectable, the margins being very clear. Inflammatory breast cancer, the best outcome in pathology complete response is found out if the patient undergoes a new adjuvant chemotherapy. Surgery is always performed regardless of the outcome of chemotherapy. 
whatever his outcome of the chemotherapy, surgery is always considered. So de-adjuvant chemotherapy is very useful. In early stage, when I take in term, when you talk in terms of early stage, we'll start from stage one. Stage one, conservative breast surgery. We talk in terms of conservative surgery because stage one, there is no need for a modified radical mastectomy. The breast can be conserved and the breast can be kept because uh, it's easy to get good results and the results are comparable with mastectomy and a conserved breast as well. What they do is a conservative breast surgery with axillary dissection versus modified radical mastectomy. Lumpectomy with axillary dissection, radiation therapy to the conserved breast, brachytherapy can be given to the lumpectomy tumor board. This is the one which is done for a conservative breast surgery. Stage one, the tumor is two centimeter or smaller or clusters of cancer cells in the lymph nodes or clusters are seen in the cancer cells plus tumor is two centimeter or smaller than that. This is stage one. The Manchester stage. There is a big role of brachytherapy in stage one. Brachytherapy is interstitial placement of catheters in the, uh, in the tumor area or the suspected tumor area where high dose of radiation can be delivered. The revolution in brachytherapy happened a decade back because earlier it was all iridium-192 wires and radium needles. Radium needles were uh, uh, radium needles were uh, hazard, uh, full of hazard. Iridium-192 wires uh, were tough to handle. But these days what we have is uh, we have a stepping source. A stepping source is a very small source which is actually about one or two millimeters length and about 0.5 millimeter thickness. This small rice grain, rice grain source travels into the catheter and gives a high dose of radiation inside the, uh, inside the uh, bracket therapy catheters. So this is very useful. This is one of the revolution bracket therapy. And earlier 3D imaging for target volume definition was not available. It was always with orthogonal films. But now we have sagittal, coronal, and transaxial uh, different films on which we can do a wonderful planning. We can do a three-dimensional imaging and three-dimensional planning as well. Applicator incision guidance was not possible earlier, but now it's possible. Three-dimensional treatment planning in brachytherapy also is very, very useful. I can show a few three-dimensional treatment planning in brachytherapy right away now. Again, you will be watching this, uh, this, this expression very often. Uh, you have to bear with me. High dose with brachytherapy. Brachytherapy, as I told you, is interstitial therapy where the radiation catheter or the radiation source is placed in the uh, targeted area and high dose is given. What are the advantages? The, short, the treatment time is very short. Earlier, it was a uh, longer treatment time. Now, the treatment time is very short. Minimum isolation, better nursing care, better patient complaints, significant reduced cost, minimal hospitalization, and the cosmesis is similar and comparable with that of electron boost or any other way of therapy when you treat the, boost, uh, treat the breast. So what does brachytherapy have to offer? Let's uh, see a few brachytherapy techniques of delivery, uh, techniques to uh, treat the breast. You have the interstitial brachytherapy. You have the template brachytherapy. You have the mammocyte brachytherapy. You have SEVI applicator. Let's go into mammocyte. First go into interstitial brachytherapy. This is a typical picture of an interstitial brachytherapy. The, the, the interstitial word itself explains. Interstitial is in between the tissues. These catheters are exactly placed through the uh, lumpectomy tumor site. The tumor is removed by lumpectomy. The breast is preserved. Axillary dissection is done. And this is the place at the tumor bed at the lumpectomy area. And we, we, the, the radiation oncologist follows certain rules and regulations uh, uh, which we, we, uh, we feel is uh, uh, useful for this particular triangle. So after the, after the placement of catheter, uh, uh, x-ray is taken and placement of catheters are checked. Once it's found to be done, once it's perfect to be, uh, once it's found to be perfect, uh, radiation planning is done and then the radiation is delivered to the tumor, uh, tumor bed. The X-ray confirms excellent geometry for this implant. And this is called uh, the radiation treatment planning. So you can see here, breast bracket therapy treatment plan, 
uh, we whatever these uh, these lines we see here is called isodosis lines, and you see here these dots here are the lines which are the uh, uh, which are the spots which indicate the uh, indicate the radiation uh, the 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 catheters which are placed here, and this is the isodose line. The red is the target area which deliver which gets about hundred percent of radiation to the main targeted lung factory site, and high dose is being delivered here. Look at here, the advantage of bracket therapy is whenever we uh, give radiation teletherapy, radiation comes from outside and comes to inside. But in bracket therapy, the radiation source inside the tissue, outside. So the advantage here is, is there any radiation goes to the lungs or the heart? Nothing. So, uh, so this is the best, uh, this is the best technique to deliver a high dose of radiation uh, to a tissue wherever it's accessible and possible. And this is called template breakage therapy. This is like this is like a template or a bridge where the breast is squeezed between these layers and uh, this is tightened. And then the radiation catheter is passed through these uh, needles and then uh, planning is done. And if the planning is found to be different, uh, found, to be, found to be perfect, the radiation source or the stepping source, what I told you, will pass through every needle from this, deliver a high dose of radiation in this area, the lumpectomy site, and then comes back. It passes through every needle and delivers a high dose of radiation. So we have template brachytherapy. And this is template brachytherapy placed here. Look at see the catheters are placed from uh, uh, one area, it enters and one area comes out. And this is the, uh, the isodose distribution you see here. Very high dose of distribution to the, uh, to the radiation source and no radiation at all to the lung area. And this is a very nice, this is a nice way to deliver a high dose of radiation to the breast uh, uh, lumpectomy site. This is also template uh, brachy. And uh, this is uh, actually a radiation plan I wanted to show here. If you see here, this is the uh, red, uh, the red isodose line, which corresponds to 100%, which means 100% of dose is being delivered here. If you see this blue area, this blue corresponds to 10%. So if 100% is delivered here, only 10% of radiation goes to this lung or the heart area, cardiac area. So this is the advantage of uh, uh, delivering a high dose of uh, radiation to the lumpectomy site. Lumpectomy site needs to be treated very well because most of the uh, recurrences were always at the lumpectomy area, uh, uh, at the vicinity of the lumpectomy area at 5 to 10 millimeter at the, uh, at the edges of the lumpectomy or the lump removal. There's one more uh, way of uh, interstitial bracket therapy called mammocyte bracket therapy. It's a US FDA approved in 2002, and the 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 mammocyte catheter looks like a looks looks like a Foley's catheter. It has a bulb there. Uh, the balloon is placed inside the lumpectomy site, and the other end stays outside of the breast. And this is the area through which the radiation source will be passed through to give a high dose of radiation to the lumpectomy site. Surgical placement of catheter, the lumpectomy wound is open. The catheter is placed with the balloon in the lumpectomy site. The, the balloon is placed at the lumpectomy site, and this is the outside catheter part, part. And this is surgical placement of the catheter. The wound is closed, and you can see the catheter is exiting outside the skin. And this is the area through which the radiation source will pass through, go through this tube, go to the lumpectomy side, give a very high dose of radiation to the uh, lumpectomy target mm -hmm. and use a very high dose over there. So this is called mammocyte, uh, uh, mammocyte uh, brachytherapy. It look, the picture it looks like this is the radiation uh, source area. The radiation uh, source passes through this catheter, comes here. And this, this bulb is, uh, this bulb is uh, inflated. And it's inflated in such a way it takes the uh, it takes the exact shape of the lumpectomy uh, vacuum area or the lumpectomy site or the tumor bed, and so that a high dose of radiation can be uh, given in a very homogeneous way at this particular area. You can also deflate or inflate this balloon whenever you want it. It's a very very a very good technique to deliver, deliver very high dose of radiation at the lumpectomy margins. Mammocyte radiation therapy, the advantage is uh, this, the treatment, the whole of this treatment will be complete in five days time. It can be a radical brachytherapy or it can be a booster dose of uh, brachytherapy. But if the patient goes for long, full, uh, full treatment radiation, it will be six weeks treatment. But here the patient can be complete, the treatment can be complete in five days time. Mammocyte 
places the radiation source inside the tumor bed and hence a very high dose of radiation is delivered to the uh, tumor bed to the area which is most likely for recurrence. The high dose to the areas of possible recurrence is delivered. Reduced dose to the surround normal tissue is uh, very well less, very well reduced. Hence, the consequences is very much good or even comparable or better than a, a brachytherapy, which is uh, delivered with some other technique or by the booster dose given by electron or any other therapy. And this is how it looks like. It irradiates the area around the lumpectomy site. This is how the picture of CD scan looks like. And this is after the bulb is being inflated. This is what's called a mammocyte bulb. This is the radiation delivery. This is the radiation source, which is called the center to deliver a very high dose of radiation to the uh, lumpic to be side. And this is the CD scan confirmation of the placement uh, to find out whether the placement is perfect and the distribution and the planning is fine. And this is how the whole picture looks like. This is the uh, radiation, the bracket therapy unit, the, uh, the stepping source, uh, which is always inside the vault here. Whenever it's given a uh, command from outside, the, the, the stepping source passes through this catheter and goes inside the mammocyte bulb, gives a dose of radiation and then comes back. Then again, goes back inside the vault here. The advantage is there is no direct contact for the radiation oncologist or with the medical physicist or with the paramedical the nurses or anyone. There is no direct contact with the exposure with radiation. The, 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 the stepping source is always under the uh, command of uh, the computer with the medical physicist or with the radiation oncologist. Post mammocyte bracket therapy, uh, this is the breast which was treated. Uh, we don't see any difference. The cosmetically, if you see, the outcome is good. So, uh, this is one uh, uh, technique which is very easy to follow and to deliver a high dose of radiation in a short, uh, in a short while of time. We can talk in terms of partial breast irradiation also because uh, most of the people now uh, have, have started going beyond the whole breast irradiation to partial breast irradiation after a, a, a conservative breast surgery is done. When I talk in terms of conservative surgery in breast, it's always mostly stage one or stage two. After lumpectomy and axillary dissection, the lumpectomy area is taken care of by a boost and the whole of this breast uh, is radiated uh, with whole breast radiation. But now the trend is people have started trying to do with partial breast radiation. When it's partial breast radiation, that is to that particular quadrant, wherever the lumpectomy was removed, that particular quadrant will be delivered with a high dose of radiation. And there is RTOG, NSABP, multicenter phase three clinical trials, which compares the whole breast and the partial breast radiation. HDR, high dose multi catheter bracket therapy. Mammocyte uh, catheter, 3D conformal external beam radiation therapy. These are all the favored partial breast irradiation uh, techniques or treatments in the treatment of uh, breast cancer. There's one more applicator called SAVI applicator. SAVI applicator is like this. It's actually like a, a small stillet. This is placed passed through the uh, lumpectomy site. Once the uh, applicator reaches the lumpectomy site, the, uh, the stillet is opened and it opens like this. It opens like this to take the shape and size of the uh, vacuum area where the lump, lump was removed. Then after that, uh, 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 a planning is done to see the isodose distribution. If it's fine, radiation dose will be passed through those catheters which are inflated inside the lumpectomy uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the lumpectomy area. Stage 2A, Manchester system. Cancer in one to three lymph nodes in the axilla or near the breast bone. Or tumor is two centimeters smaller, cancer in one to three lymph nodes in the axilla or near the breast bone. Tumor is larger than two centimeter, but not larger than five centimeter in size. Stage 2B, tumor is larger than two centimeter, but not larger than five centimeter in size. Tumor is larger than two centimeter, but not larger than five centimeter, but the cancer is there in one to three lymph nodes in the axilla or near the breast bone. When they talk in terms of breast bone, they talk in terms of internal mammary nodes. Tumor is larger than five centimeter in size. Stage two B. Stage two is, uh, 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 we can take it as uh, between, uh, midway between the early and the late stage. When, in, when you think in terms of a, a, con a conservative breast, when you want to conserve the, conserve the breast, 
the points to think or to consider when you do a counseling is younger age patient non pendulous breast morphology and contour should be maintained above because whenever you want to cancel the breast radiation comes into the play when you want to give a high dose of distribution high dose of radiation when you want a homogeneous distribution the breast should not be pendulous the morphology and contour should be maintained above so this is one important criteria when you think in terms of uh, conservative breast management or else you go for a modified radical mastectomy mastectomy with axillary dissection so again the uh, brain teaser uh, what are the indications for breast and chest wall radiotherapy all conserved breast to be treated with the radiation all the conserved breast has to be treated with radiation therapy whether you treat the whole breast with whole breast irradiation or with partial breast irradiation or or with a bracket therapy it depends on the uh, early stage and the middle stage or whatever stage you are deciding on if the tumor is very small you can just do a lumpectomy followed by a radical bracket therapy with a mammocyte bracket therapy or with interstitial bracket therapy or any type but if the if the lumpectomy after the removal if the tumor is found to be 2 cm or even more then you think in terms of a whole breast irradiation followed by some other ways of uh, bracket therapy or boost which can be given but what are the what are the indications for uh, radiation therapy after the after the surgery after the modified radical mastectomy tumor size should not should be more than 5 cm node should be positive positive or close margins a high grade tumor younger patients this is this these are the important points along with that inadequate nodal dissection triple negative receptor status conserving two new positive tumors skin nipple or pectoralis muscle invasion these are all the points or these are all the indicators or the indications where the patient has to be taken up for post surgical or post operative radiation therapy to the chest wall but again the point to uh, remember or uh, things to always remember is a conserved breast has to be always treated with radiation whatever is the indication or even if there is no indication the, the breast has to be treated uh, the whole of the breast has to be treated with radiation what is the volume what is the target volume after the uh, breast conservation surgery whole breast radiotherapy plus lumpectomy boost the supraclavicular or the internal membrane nodes this will be the target volume after you do a breast conservative surgery if you want to radiate the axilla then axillary lymph nodes should be more than four lymph nodes positivity perinodal positivity and any other regional nodes then you can think in terms of axillary lymph node radiation also in terms of after mastectomy which is a modified radical radical mastectomy or any mastectomy the the target volume will involve the uh, chest wall the drainage tube scar the mastectomy scar and the regional lymph node this will be the target volume when when we talk in terms of radiation uh, it's uh, it could be radiation with uh, photons or it with it, 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 it can be radiation with gamma rays from telecobalt but these days we have a very uh, latest uh, different techniques of uh, delivery of a high dose of radiation to the target whenever i i i, I talk in terms of a, a good technique it means a very high dose of radiation is given to the area of interest and a very minimal dose is given to the organs at risk or the normal tissues so this is one uh, one technique where you can see it's a three dimensional conformal radiation therapy always called it's called 3d crt where you see the whole of this breast is radiated to a very high dose of radiation but unfortunately you can see some amount of radiation also reaches the lungs and a part of the cardiac area also i will show the next technique where you can see this 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 uh, shaded area or this color wash this area of radiation which uh, in this lungs and heart you see here will not be seen in the next planning techniques or system which i'm going to show you now this is called iomrt it's called intensity modulated radiation therapy technique where uh, a, a beam is divided into segments and every segment is divided into small parts and you can you can really manipulate and you can treat any area which you want to uh, treat and whatever you could be the size or shape of the target accordingly we can treat uh, without any problem you see here the same target which is being treated with intensity modulated radiation therapy you don't get any radiation spillover dose 
or any exit doors or any entry into the lung area or in the cardiac area. So that's why these days, the oncologists or radiation oncologists, whenever they talk to the patient, they always tell them that the techniques available now for radiation uh, delivery are really good. And uh, the techniques the techniques available now always uh, try to give a very high dose of radiation to the target and minimal dose to the dose of the minimal dose of radiation to the normal tissue and organs at risk. For example, here the organ at risk is the lung, the heart, and also maybe the spinal cord. So uh, any any latest technique uh, helps you to give a high dose of radiation to the to the target uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the easiest way. This this is the other technique called VMAT, also called also known as rapid arc technique. You, if you see here, the target volume is completely uh, completely uh, it's completely covered. The distribution is homogeneous. There is no problem at all. And what you see here, like a, a railway track, is nothing but it shows that this is the uh, movement area through which the gantry of uh, the teletherapy machine keeps moving. The, pro the, the thing is, in, with rapid arc, the gantry always keeps moving and it keeps delivering a high dose of radiation to this target. So what happens here is the integral dose is less and the dose to the normal tissues is very, very minimal. So in, 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 in fact, if you compare with VMAT and IMRT, VMAT gives a very high dose of radiation to the target and very, very minimal uh, dose to the normal tissues, which means integral dose to other tissues also is very, very less. This is called rapid arc or VMAT technique. And hypofractionated radiation therapy in, uh, in breast cancer. When we, when we talk in terms of hypofractionation, normal conventional fractionation means 200 centigrade per day for five fractions a week, which means a patient, uh, a, 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 a carcinoma breast who undergoes a, a full course of radiation will have to undergo treatment for six weeks of time. This hypofractionated radiation therapy technique is one. We have a lot of benefits. Logistics is better the patient convenience is better. A common fractionation regimen is 42.5 gray in 16 fractions. Normally, a treatment, the whole, uh, the whole length of treatment for a breast uh, radiation therapy will be about 25 to 30 fractions over a period of five to six weeks time. But uh, here, it's 16 fractions and in three weeks time, followed by a boost in four fractions. So basically in about 25, in 25 or 20 fractions time, the whole, dose of radiation can be delivered to a lung, to, to the breast, and uh, the, 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 you will be able to maintain or enhance the therapeutic gain. At the same time, the dose equivalence will be, be better. For example, this 42.5 gray in six fra 16 fractions, which is delivered in three weeks' time, is comparable with a six weeks uh, treatment, 50 gray, or 50 gray or 55 gray in 25 or 27 fractions' time. So if you compare, at 25 and 16, 16 fractions is certainly less and delivers the same dose equivalence. It maintains or enhances the therapeutic gain also. Stage three, no tumor or tumor in any size, cancer in four to nine lymph nodes in the axilla or in the breastbone. The tumor is larger than five centimeter with clusters of cancer cells in the lymph nodes. Tumor is larger than five centimeter. Cancer is seen in one to three lymph nodes in the axilla or near the breastbone. K3B is uh, an inflammatory breast cancer. You can see uh, a skin lesion here. Stage 3C is uh, cancer in 10 or more lymph nodes in the axilla, cancer in lymph nodes above or below the collarbone, cancer in the lymph nodes in the axilla and near the breastbone, and no tumor or tumor, no tumor or tumor in any size is seen in this particular uh, category. Stage three, where the tumor is slightly being big, we straightly, uh, uh, we straight, uh, straight away don't, we cannot go for the uh, uh, planned therapy. So you always try to go for a new adjuvant chemotherapy. When you give new adjuvant chemotherapy, the tumor becomes operable. If the tumor becomes operable after the surgery, radiation therapy is being delivered. If the tumor after new adjuvant chemotherapy becomes non-operable or remains non-operable, try to give external radiation therapy to make that operable and take it forward. The most commonest regimen is AC regimen, which is adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Paclitaxel and adriamycin-based regimen is the, uh, which is the latest one. Hybrid regimen is AC, which is adria cyclophosphamide followed by paclitaxel and adriamycin regimen. 
Stage four is NET, NEN, and M1. Stage four cancer has spread to other organs of the body, most often the bones, the lungs, the liver, or the brain. Stage four is also known as metastatic breast cancer. It could be pulmonary, hepatic, skeletal, breast, brain. Osseous metastatic lesions do not respond well to chemotherapy. They respond well to radiation and hormone therapy. Visceral lesions respond well to chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Bandrol, zoledonic acid is usually the treatment of choice to treat hypercalcemia when there is multiple osseous metastatic lesions. Radiation can also be given uh, once in a while when there is a need for uh, uh, involvement of any bone involvement. If there is any uh, hepatic lesions, SBRT can be given. Toilet or simple mastectomy, whenever needed, can also be done in stage four. Again, this gentleman is here. Management and prognosis of ductal carcinoma in situ. Ductal carcinoma in situ is curative. But if you do a mastectomy, it's curative, 95% of the patients. Recurrence is rare, but residual ductal carcinoma in situ, the ducts, if they're not removed during surgery, they can, they, they can remain as occult foci and they could become a reason for recurrence. Breast conservation cannot be done or if should not be done because there is a slightly higher rates of recurrence. So if you see a, a ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, you should not think in terms of a, a conservative breast. You should always only think, think in terms of a modic, modified radical mastectomy. The major risk factors for recurrence in a ductal carcinoma in situ are great size, margins, in ER positive, in estrogen receptor positive, ductal carcinoma in situ, post-op radiation plus tamoxifen, the recurrence rate is very, very low. So if it's ER positive, DCAS, after the surgery, post-op radiation with tamoxifen, it's very much helpful to control the disease and reduce the chances of recurrences. Triple negative breast cancer, also known as TNBC, represents about 15% of all the breast cancers more likely to present in the younger women. We are told the, the triple negative breast cancer is usually found in less than 40 years age group, may be associated with having an inherited mutation related to BRCA genes. And this is also taken as a prognostic uh, indicator because triple negative breast cancer usually do not do that well when compared to a triple positive or ER positive uh, disease. So it's taken as a very important prognostic indicator also. Triple negative breast cancer, although endocrine therapy and HER2 new directed therapies do not work here. In triple negative breast cancer, when ERPR is positive and HER2 new is positive, uh, any therapy cannot be directed except chemotherapy. Chemotherapy works the best. Trials of chemotherapy, such as recent advances, provide greatest benefits uh, uh, out of uh, chemotherapy. A significant percentage of TNBC treated with chemotherapy before surgery completely disappear, demonstrates its sensitivity to therapy. Is there a role of angiogenesis inhibition in triple negative breast cancer? Yes, there is an analysis of triple negative breast cancer subset of recent studies with Vivazizumab has suggested that possible specific benefit for more than that could be seen in ER positive breast cancer. Platinum chemotherapy is a responsible treatment for metastatic TNPC. And TNBC is very sensitive to wide variety of chemotherapeutic regimens, especially to paclitaxel and adriamycin. Metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we try to treat with Everlimus, which is a, a mTOR inhibitor, Keytruda is pembrolizumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor, uh, Inipar, which is a triple negative one, uh, uh, useful for PARP inhibition. Ovarian ablation or suppression, this is also a strategy to take care. Ovarian ablation is classically includes techniques uh, which causes permanent cessation of menstruation. The techniques usually done are surgical oophorectomy or radiation induced oophorectomy. Surgical oophorectomy is easily done. Radiation oophorectomy, I just tell you, it's non-invasive, cheap procedure. The dose is four to five grain single fractions to ten to twenty grain five six fractions. After that, it takes about two to three months time. After which the uh, the periods menstrual period stops. Ovarian ablation had a very large positive effect on both disease, free survival, and overall survival. Pathogenesis, like a couple of few slides, and after that, I'll be finishing. 
Most common genes implicated in breast cancer are BRCA1, hereditary BRCA2, P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and CHECK2 uh, gene as well. Breast cancer, the penetrance of 50 to 60 percent of BRCA carriers will develop breast cancer compared to 12 percent of all of them. If you see the BRCA1 carrier and BRCA2 carrier, uh, the, pre the, the, the presentation is completely different. BRCA1 appears 20 years earlier than normal, more often triple negative, no ER, PR, or HER2 positivity. All of them are negative, cannot be treated with hormone therapy or with herceptin. So this BRCA1 can be treated only with, with, with a dose of high dose of radiation, dose dense chemotherapy or something. BRCA2 cancer usually appears after the menopause. It can show up earlier, but they just spikes at menopause. Usually they are ER or PR positive, and they're very, very vulnerable to hormone therapy. BRCA one and two, how they are dealt with? The BRCA breast cancer is 50 to 80 percent, often early age of diagnosis in BRCA one and two. The chances of second breast cancer is 40 to 60 percent chances. Ovarian cancer is 40 to 60 percent chances in BRCA one and two mutation. BRCA mutation, I think you you have certainly heard about this a very long time back. Uh, Angelina, who, who who underwent a bilateral prophylactic a mastectomy because she tested positive for BRCA mutation. BRCA1, I think she tested positive for BRCA1. She went for bilateral mastectomy and also she went for oophorectomy also. So the take home message is uh, why you want to give radiation? Uh, to decrease the local recurrence rates. Same local controls are uh, achieved with mastectomy also. If you have a conservative breast and if you have a mastectomy, in the early stages, if you do conserved breast, if you uh, go for a dose of radiation, the results are comparable. Same overall survival is same for a mastectomy as well as the conserved breast. So why not you try breast conservation itself? Uh, if you see, if you see here, uh, uh, the non-invasive cancer, ductal carcinoma site, which means these patients have undergone uh, a radical mastectomy, the recurrence rate was 32%. After radiation, it comes down to 16%. It was 26%, which came down to 15% in DCIS who underwent a modified radical mastectomy. But if it was an invasive cancer or breast cancer where a cancer breast was done, the chances of uh, recurrence rate was 39.2%, which came down to 14.3%. So same local control as mastectomy, same overall survival as mastectomy, and the advantage is you conserve the breast and uh, the, the, the survival rates are almost comparable with mastectomy. So always, wherever there is a, a chance for radiation early do, early stages of uh, a disease in breast cancer, try to, get, try to deliver radiation too. Breast conservation is the mainstay and preferred treatment for most women. Breast conservation offers equivalent local tumor control and survival to mastectomy. Poisil breast accelerated treatment appears promising and exact, less time commitment, but further study needs to be done. Radiation therapy is well tolerated and results in good to excellent cosmesis. The conclusions to conclude, I would say that radiation therapy plays a, a very important role or a big role in conservative breast management, as well as chest wall radiation in modified radical mastectomy. High precise irradiation techniques like IMRT and VMAT Reduce the radiation dose to lungs and heart, hence should be given a chance and preference wherever possible. Triple negative breast cancer sensitive and response to paclitaxel based regimen. TNBC metastatic, promising drugs now available, as I told you. We were talking in terms of mTOR inhibitor, uh, PARP inhibitors, and other drugs, but a lot, lot of studies are going on. Soon you'll be, uh, you can see some light at the end of the tunnel. DCIS conservation is not recommended. MRM is a better one to go for if you have ductal carcinoma in situ. BRCA mutation, clinical decision making could be done only after discussing with the patient or the family and then go for a proper discussion, proper decision if there is a BRCA mutation. Breast brachytherapy is the best choice for early stages uh, in breast cancer and it's a very underutilized one. So it should be given a lot of, lot of uh, preference now in the, uh, in, the, in the days to come. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Very wonderful, nice, crisp and clarity presentation. Update on the uh, breast cancer management. Wonderful, wonderful. We all enjoyed thank all you, the updates. Thank you. There thank are you. questions, uh, Alex. Uh, Dr. Sundar Murthy, sir, is a pulmonologist professor. 
Paris is asking one question. Does radiotherapy treatment outcome differ in CA breast in women and men? Does radiotherapy treatment outcome differ in CA breast in women and men? Uh, can I answer? Yeah, yeah. Please answer, Alex. No, actually, the 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 the, 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 no, the radiation planning uh, will be the same whether it's a female breast cancer or a, or a male breast. The 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 planning is uh, all, all almost the same. There's no difference at all. Fine, fine. Thank you. Only thing is maybe the 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 the, the thorax will be slightly uh, flat for a male to plan. Uh, you know, in a women it will be slightly different. So the planning could take a bit more time for uh, women than in the male. But otherwise, the techniques, everything is almost the same. Wow, fantastic. Okay. One more question from Professor Sundar Muthi, sir, is the role of stem cell therapy in carcinoma breast? <laughs> it's still, uh, it's still at the, uh, still, uh, you know, it's a budding only, but at the level, it's a okay. lot of studies are going on, but nothing, uh, nothing really, uh, till now is uh, seen till now. On, okay. on, on the stem cell therapy. Oh, fine. A lot of studies are going on. Going on. Fully agree. One more question from uh, Dr. R.P. from Pudukote. Mm. If the CA involved the breast with the axillary, mammary, and supraclavicular lymph nodes with metastasis in the bone, sternum, what would be the choice of treatment? That okay. means advanced cancer. There is stage yeah. 4 that he is mentioning. What is the <laughs> This doctor has mentioned it's uh, involving the breast, axillary, mammary, supraclavicular, and, and bones. Bone. Stage, yeah. four. stage four, if this patient, uh, if you see the ERPR hormone status, if the ERPR is positive, then they would respond very well to hormone therapy with tamoxifen or uh, letrozole. Along with that, if at all the skeletal lesions have any uh, lytic lesions or any possible sites which can fracture up, they can give radiation to that, those areas of lytic lesions. Otherwise, hormone lesion and palliative chemotherapy would be the, uh, would be the choice. Okay, fine. One more question, Dr. Kundavi. Pregnancy and breast cancer. How to how will you approach a pregnant lady with a CA breast? Actually, that will <laughs> uh, give uh, an idea to give another talk uh, with that particular yeah. topic. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's a big that's a big one. Actually, there, 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 there are a few collections of slides for that too. Maybe if IMA invites me, I can come and talk at that too. But that's wow. very, very vast and big one. Yeah. It cannot be explained in one, one particular slide or in another one or two minutes time. Okay. One more actually, the, actually, ah. actually, that's interesting too. Interesting. Yeah, pregnancy and breast cancer is a separate topic. Vast, yeah. Very big topic. Separate that, topic. Can be itself, that, can, that alone can be given as one special talk. Okay. One more question. Huh? In the case of DCIS, I do not know what is DCIS, who underwent excision, needs MRM or radiation, sir? See, ductal carcinoma and cyto, most of the oh, okay. most of the studies they found out if they try to do a modified radical mastectomy, it's better. But if they undergo a uh, uh, conservative breast where lumpectomy is done, and they found that most of them landed up with local recurrences. This ductal carcinoma and cyto is known to be, known to be Hiding in uh, as a, a small occult uh, foca in small small areas, which cannot be easily screened. So if you if you do a modified uh, mastectomy, it's safe. But if you go for a conserved breast, you might land up in uh, failure. That is recurrence rate. That's why uh, DCIS and ductal carcinoma is the better better choice is always radical mastectomy to go for, not conservative breast. Mm -hmm. Oh, fine. That uh, from Dr. Pudukote, doctor is asking the uh, question that is a CA breast with uh, metastasis to the you know, uh, memory supraclavicular lymph node and bone metastasis. This patient is a HER2 positive. HER2 positive. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> you, you, actually, whenever we do a biopsy or when you do anything, uh, the, the token biopsy itself, we send the specimen to do this uh, ER, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 new. Uh, uh, status to find out because based on ERPR, we can easily handle with hormone therapy. With HER2 new positivity, the best drug which is available now is, as I told you, trastuzumab. Trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody. This will negate the presence of uh, Herceptin uh, receptors in the body and in the breast. So if you if you treat with trastuzumab, the result could be my could be good. Oh, that, that, that's one that's one uh, indication that doctor has told. 
that this patient is positive for HER2 new. So we can easily treat with trastuzumab okay. along with chemotherapy added. Okay. One more question from Dr. Sundamurthy, sir. CA breast outcome after and before menopause. Uh, CA breast okay. before and after yeah. menopause. Yeah, yeah. Before and after it's menopause. Just, Is there any difference uh, in the outcome? Before yeah, menopause? It's, it's a straightforward, uh, straightforward question and I can give a straightforward answer. <laughs> Post-menopausal women respond very well. Oh. And oh. pre-menopausal women all, always have a very bad disease and very bad results. And if you look into uh, uh, introspection, most of these pre-menopausal ladies, if you look into ERPS status and everything, most of them can be a triple negative, which triple negative means ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 new. And as I, and as I explained, and as I told you, if they're triple negative, they don't respond very well. Whereas post-menopausal ladies, if you go for a, a ERPR and HER2 new study, they will be positive either for ERPR or HER2 new. So because of that, we have nice drugs to treat them and result will be very good. So to, to draw a line, postmenopausal ladies do well, premenopausal ladies do not really do well. Okay, fine. One more question, Dr. T. Thirmani Selvi. After menopause, breast cancer rate is increasing even for multiple. Why? No, I didn't get it. <laughs> After menopause, breast cancer rate is increasing even for multiple. Why? Multi multiple. Uh, I don't know. After that, uh, we didn't write anything. Ceremony still be. Uh, can you unmute your uh, mic? Uh, and, yeah. I, I, I know exactly about that. This is the written words in the chat box. Just you can open the chat box and see. This is the thing. After menopause, breast cancer rate is increasing even for multiple. Multiple means multiple metal. I don't know if they're multiple. Why? I don't know exactly about what he's asking. Thirumuni, you can unmute your mic and you can ask uh, that, Alex. Thirumuni? After menopause, breast cancer rate is increasing even for, for multiple. Why? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Maybe, uh, I, I, I really I really didn't get the uh, exact question. We can take it as an early menarche, a late menopause, that could be a reason. Late menopause could okay. be a reason for, uh, you know, like uh, breast cancer. Mm, otherwise, I don't get any uh, clues from that question to really answer. Thirumani Silvi, doctor, can give me that question again. Uh, uh Dr. Alice, I think she's asking why the number of breast cancer cases has been increasing even, uh, you know, uh, during menopausal time or maybe post-menopausal time. Um, actually, if you look at the risk factors, uh, the age group, if you look at the risk factors, it's always 55 plus. When you, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you saw the slide, uh, how do you screen uh, with mammo, mammogram? Uh, I have mentioned there are 55 plus. When the age group is 55 plus, they have to undergo every uh, mammogram every two years to make sure that they go for a, they go for a proper screen. That is clearly tells that postmenopausal ladies the chances are very high. That's why 55 plus are always at high risk, and they are uh, requested to go for a mammogram once every two years. Okay, Samia, can you unmute the uh, Dr. Trimuni Silvi's uh, no, mic? Can you unmute or uh, because Madam is raising the hand, wants to answer or wants to clarify some doubt about this? Uh, I have uh, asked her unmute. Uh, she needs to unmute and talk actually. I have. Uh, yeah, Trimuni, you can unmute your mic and you can talk to Alex. Trimuni, can you hear me, why? Anyway. Yeah, one more question. After how many years post chemo, if a patient has frozen her embryos, can plan her pregnancy? Is there a recurrence chance? Alex, after how many years post chemo, if a patient has frozen her embryos, can plan her pregnancy? Is there a recurrence chance? Uh, uh, no, here you're talking only in terms of chemo, chemotherapy alone. Uh, if the patient is in the early stage, late stage, if the patient is a, a disease, uh, is locorigitally controlled, if the patient is locorigitally controlled, there is no evidence for any disease elsewhere, then I think after two years, you can go ahead with the pregnancy plan. But if there is disease elsewhere 
and the patient has taken chemotherapy two years back, then what is the point? With the disease there, you cannot go for it. So if there is any uh, any investigation which tells there is no evidence of disease anywhere in the body or elsewhere in the body, if the, if the patient is disease-free, and uh, two years should be a good gap after chemotherapy. Okay. I think uh, this multiple means multiparous women. After menopause, breast cancer rate is increasing even uh, even for uh, multiparous women. Why? Yeah. This is the question, I think. Yes. But actually, uh, Dr. Thirumani Silvi, uh, if you look at the risk factors, we don't see a lot of multiparous multi women now we, uh, uh, with, with breast cancers. Uh, most of them, uh, you know, like uh, elderly primary or, you know, minimal of uh, one or two children. And we don't see multi-parous uh, women now. With, maybe once in a while we could see, but that really uh, show or tells uh, that most of them are multi women land up with breast cancer. We don't get to see that. In, when we were dealing with a lot of uterine cervix, we used to see a lot of multi parous women. And uh, those women were really at risk because early marriage, uh, multiple pregnancies, multiple delivery, and they landed up in uterine cervix cancers. It was breast cancer really, maybe once in a while, one or two here and there, but otherwise we don't see a lot of multiparous women uh, with breast cancer. Does that answer your question? Anyway, good. That is the connection, she's not able yeah, to yeah. properly. <laughs> Wonderful, Alex. A lot of questions. So very nice update on the uh, breast cancer. You know? Thank you very much. Thanks in the management. Thank you, Alex. We enjoy a lot of uh, learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Sophia, much for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Moti, sir, for this wonderful. Sir, you can uh, give a word of thanks or Swami can give the word of thanks. If there are no questions, sir. Thank you, Alex. Very nice. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Moti, sir. Unmute your mic, sir. What is that? Uh, tell me, sir. Yeah, who is going to give what of thanks? Very nice. You, Enjoyed it. Please, uh, no problem. Uh, you give. Yeah, madam. Yeah. Come here. Yes, sir. So, on behalf of uh, Medpiper Technologies, Journal Med, IMA, MGM Healthcare, Varam, uh, we thank Dr. Alex, Alex Sir for uh, uh, giving us a wonderful insights on the trends and uh, various stages of breast cancer updates and uh, uh, some detailed inputs on radio radiation oncology, chemotherapy and uh, later details. Uh, thank you for spending your time uh, on yeah. a Saturday evening. Uh, thank you so much, thank Doctor. You. We look forward to connect with you for a lot more sessions related to radiation oncology and uh, breast cancer uh, yeah. uh, therapy yeah. and treatments. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful. Thank you, Mutisa. Thank you, Somia. Nice, Alex. Thank you. Wonderful.